Okay, so in my Shroud uh, panel review show number two, I covered with uh, Mark Guskin, Bob Rucker, Joe Marino, and Hugh Ferry a second line of evidence that Shroud skeptics try to provide as warrant for the truth of premise two, namely that it's true that the Shroud of Turin is probably medieval. And this is based on the 1389 Bishop Darcy Memorandum, as well as the surrounding medieval documents that, uh, you know, such as the papal bulls from the 1390s that uh, Hugh Ferry says proves the shroud uh, dates to the medieval period and was a medieval artistic fake, uh, a fake relic there. And um, we also bring up the pilgrim's badge or the uh, medallion that people got that clearly depicts the Shroud of Turin. All sides agree on that front. Has the herringbone weave cloth and a naked man front and back, along with the coat of arms of Geoffrey de Charny and Jean de Vergy, the owners of the Shroud of Turin, uh, during from 1350 to 1390. So these are the, the next arguments that are said, okay, look, we failed on the carbon 14, but surely these medieval documents and badges prove that the Shroud of Turin is a medieval artistic fake. So let's get into our assessment of this then. And as we saw in the panel review, once again, it is solely the Shroud skeptic who has the burden of proof alone. They have to prove that these things are authentic and that they are historically accurate in reporting that the Shroud is an artistic fake or for the purposes of our panel show here, that they date from the medieval period, that they are probably medieval. On this front, I think, all things considered, it was an utter failure. So nothing, in terms of my overall judgment, the Shroud skeptic still fails. I, I haven't changed my mind, and I'm warranted in believing that there's a 50% or less probability that the Shroud is probably medieval on the basis of these factors. Now that said, there were some interesting things that came up in the panel reviews that have changed my mind on specific evidences, one in favor of the Shroud skeptics and another possibly against it. Um, so I just want to go over some, some of the interesting notes. Again, I'm not going to go over in detail and assess this. I've done that on prior shows, or you can go to the panel review, uh, show number two, as well as my Shroud Wars round one debate with Alan, where we get into a lot of details. Or I, I did a Shroud Wars debate between Hugh Ferry, the Shroud skeptic, and a, a medieval historian, Dr. Cheryl White, where we all admit that these things fail, but um, to convince kind of thing. So in that sense, in terms of providing, I would say we have an undefeated defeater, undercutting defeater for these items. And therefore there's a 50% or less, just for the sake of argument, again, it's less, it's like 0%, but uh, there's no proof that the shroud is probably medieval on this basis. And my opinion remains the same as it was back in 2018 on this front. Um, however, there were certain minor changes, as I mentioned, that I just want to go over and, and highlight and summarize some of the interesting findings that were new or that I did change my mind on, on the basis of the panel uh, panel show number two that we did. Okay, so let's start out with the good news for the Shroud skeptics. Uh, so one of my strongest lines of evidence back in 2018 was I appealed to a letter that we have signed and dated, absolute historically proven fact, uh, written by Bishop Darcy's, Darcy's predecessor, Bishop Henry de Portier. Remember the bishop who allegedly who allegedly conducted the inquiry and hated the, the Leary Church for showing the false shroud and the artist confessed that it's all a fake. Uh, you know, I faked it, I painted it, and stuff like that. And I, I said, well, this is complete historical horse trash because we actually have a letter dated three to four months just prior to when Geoffrey I de Charny died saying, guess what, the Leary Church? I love it. Amazing. Beautiful job, my friend. Everything you're doing, great, grand, and groovy. And this is a letter, again, dated, signed and dated just prior by this alleged bishop who held an inquiry. And it would have been impossible for him to hold an inquiry in a short three to four month period and, and or something just before he died. I use this as an argument saying, look, this actually contradicts Bishop Darcis's memo in terms of the this alleged inquiry where the artist confessed to faking the shroud in the 1350. Now, I think Hugh had a, a good counter that works, and guess what? I think he's right. 
I, I have to retract this because it's true we have this letter and it dates to when it dates from a few months before Jeffrey the first de Charny died. But here's the here's the problem. I, I was basing it on an assumption with the medallion, the medallion that Jeffrey the first was actually sharing, showing the Shroud of Turin. Uh, and that's on the basis of the medallion. I'll get to that in in a moment. So that assumption's gone with the medallion. And also, um, you know, some other things that I researched whereby it would have been Jeffrey the first de Charny showing the shroud prior to the letter that Henry de Portier showed. I actually don't have warrant for that. And he, he was right to kind of point that out. And he said, well, if once you lose that, maybe Jeffrey the first de, first de Charny died. And his wife, while his son Jeffrey the second was a little kid, he she started showing the shroud after Jeffrey the first's death. And that's when Henry de Portier conducted the inquiry. Henry de Portier didn't die until 1370. So that gives him about 14 years to conduct the inquiry. Obviously, Bishop Darcy, if you're a Shroud skeptic, he says, well, it was 34 years earlier. So, okay, maybe, maybe in 1356, 1389 or 1390 minus 34 is about 1356 to 13, you know, 1356, about then. Or maybe in early 1357, this inquiry happened after uh, Jeffrey I had died. Uh, and I had to admit, yeah, that that could have been the that could be the case. That's an equally probable explanation or, or hypothesis, historical hypothesis as to what happened. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm no longer going to. I think we can't use the letter of Bishop Henry de Poitier as a disproof that the Darcy Memorandum is a fake and all a lie. Uh, so that's a change in favor of the Shroud skeptics. Obviously, that change does nothing to prove, to help the Shroud skeptic with his burden of proof in proving that Darcy's memorandum is, in fact, accurate in what it reports. No, that that's irrelevant. It, it's just that Hugh has presented a successful defeater-defeater, right? He's presented a defeater that defeats my undercutting defeater based on Henry's letter, right? So the way it works is the Shroud skeptic says, the Shroud is medieval, Oh, prove it. We have the 1389 Darcy Memorandum as proof. It claims there was an inquiry held by Henry de Portier 34 years ago where the artist confessed he just painted this this thing. Then we assess that and I say, well, that's, but I have a defeater for that because we have a letter of Henry de Portier in the thir dated 1356 where he says, uh, guess what? No problems. I love what you're doing at the Leary Church. You're all great, grand, and groovy. Keep it up. But then he was saying, yeah, but the inquiry didn't happen until after Jeffrey I de Charny died. There's a defeater for your Henry de Portier letter defeater. Do you have anything to say against that? And I, after looking into it, I realized no. So, so two fairies successfully defeated that defeater. However, during, but during that panel review, Joe Marino presented something else that might be a different defeater. And he appealed to a Bishop Raguer, who was actually the immediate successor, according to Joe, of Bishop Darcy. So he came immediately after Bishop Darcy. And this Bishop Louis Raguer maintained that the shroud was authentic. And he maintained the shroud's authenticity in no less than three official documents that we have today. Now, think about, so this is a new defeater that I'd never encountered and could possibly uh, be used as something to refute the Shroud skeptic because, look, why would the immediate successor obviously would have all the records if there truly was an inquiry where the artist confessed and Bishop Darcy was consulting these legal professional notes of this inquiry and had access to this in his records, well, his immediate successor would, proven beyond all reasonable doubt, have access to these same records, and he would know it was a representation and not authentic. And yet here he is saying it is authentic. Um, so if this is defeater is true, I think this would defeat Hugh Ferry's claims because it's very unlikely that the immediate successor of Bishop Darcy would not have access to the records or neglect neglect them and, and out of nowhere say that the shroud is authentic without due warrant on his part. Uh, or at the very least, you know, neglect the the records saying that it wasn't authentic. Um, no, that would just be 
too negligent to be plausible in my humble opinion. Now that said, in that same panel show, panel review show number two, the Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry made a contradictory claim. He said, uh, possibly contradictory, I, again, I don't know the dates for this Bishop Raguar, if it was, but he said, look, can you find, any, there was no one that mentioned the Shroud was authentic until around the 1450s or something like that, or at one point he said, there was nothing prior to the date 1420 at which point there became two, at least two people who mentioned that the Shroud was authentic. So I don't know if uh, Hugh Ferry is, is saying, well, the successor of Bishop Darcy was Bishop Reguar, and in 1420 or after that date, he said the Shroud was authentic. Just a quick update note. So looking into, into it, um, I actually was mistaken. So there is no contradiction here, possibly, because Hugh Ferry said that it was after 1450, and guess what? Looking at it, uh, Bishop Louis Raguar, according to the catholichierarchy.org website, says that Bishop Louis Raguar was, not, was the Bishop of Troy. He was appointed first on December 23rd, 1450. So he was not the immediate successor of uh, Bishop Darcy. Um, he was you know, maybe like the second one afterwards. But still, we would still have this argument where we would expect him to have access, you know, some 60 years after the fact, there was no fires, no wartime destruction of the Troy and, and or its church and the records that, that were kept there. So yeah, uh, this guy would have access to all the records and therefore we would expect him to know if the shroud was a fake and he would not pronounce it to be authentic three times in official documents. Uh, and then obviously Louis Regoire, he resigned in about December 3rd, 1483 as the Bishop of Troyes. Uh, and then he died in 1488 on August 19th. So that's uh, the info from Louis Regoire there. And that is consistent with Hugh's claim that they're not until 14, about 1450 do we have a couple of mentions from people, um, which obviously I, it sounds like would include this Bishop Louis Regoire, Bishop of Troyes, saying that the shroud is authentic. Um, but I still think that the defeater can be made there because he was not just a random bishop, he was the Bishop of Troyes, the same uh, diocese as uh, Pierre Darcis, who made this memorandum, and therefore he would know that there was no inquiry, that that was fake. Henry de Portier never did an inquiry. Now, there is one thing I uh, just want to mention as a total aside. It's not relevant to what the topic we're talking about. Uh, but it's something that kept coming up with Mark Guskin, the pro shroud expert and historian there. And uh, it was something that he kept misunderstanding. And I, I just wanted to clarify, just out of interest's sake, my audience will already know ab about this, that he was mistaken there. But he kept making this mistaken claim that I said when I presented the shroud skeptics two premise argument, not mine, not what I believe, but what I'm seeing the shroud skeptic is arguing argues typically he was trying to say well look if he kind of misunderstood where i was saying the shroud skeptic claims that if the shroud is medi probably medieval then it's a then it's not a miraculous image and mark kept misunderstanding that for me to be claiming uh personally that i believe well if the shroud is, dates back to the first century or goes back to the historical jesus it's there for a miracle and i i said that's not what i'm saying i at one point I said, I, I do agree with you on that front. However, um, I just want to say uh, I totally disagree with Mark's uh, hesitance for using the word supernatural or appealing to miracles. We're supposed to be Christians. We're not afraid of language or afraid of saying that God is, I boldly and confidently say God does miracles. And I'm not ashamed uh, to use that word, regardless of how atheists and skeptics or people of the godless variety will take that. That's their problem and their fault for being irrational and stupid. I'm not going to cater to that. So uh, I'm kind of an expert as, as a philosopher on the issue of identifying miracles. Obviously, Mark did, doesn't know my background and stuff like that, but uh, you guys already know I, I use intelligent design theory and specified complexity to say miracles defined as uh, events that are intelligently designed by God for a specified purpose such as authenticating uh, the Christian religion or authenticating a given religion and I ha use various criteria to identify those of which the Shroud of Turin fulfills its image formation including those minimal relevant features fulfills those criteria 
Therefore, we are warranted in saying it is a miracle. However, one, one thing I just want to note is uh, I agreed with Mark at the time in general uh, that, look, just, just proving that the Shroud of Turin dates to the first century and or even that it belonged to the historical Jesus in particular, alone, that alone isn't enough to prove that it's a miracle. However, I do think that you could argue for that being miraculous when used in conjunction with the fact that the shroud images are totally unique and mysterious. We haven't solved conclusively the issue of how those images were formed. That circumstance combined with the fact that we can prove it goes back to the historical Jesus, that constitutes an, ex or one could argue, I think, that that constitutes an extraordinary circumstance or extraordinary circumstances and on that basis potentially argue that it is in fact a miracle of God. So just speaking philosophically, which is my area of expertise, Mark is is wrong in what he said. Uh, you know, that it, it's totally irrelevant whether or not we can date the Shroud to the historical Jesus. No, that could play a case for miracles based on extraordinary circumstances potentially. But yeah, again, that would need to be combined with a, a other set of circumstances like the uniqueness, you know, dates to belonged to Jesus, plus it's unique and mysterious. Uh, those two circumstances combined, I think, qualify as being extraordinary. And we could say, yeah, it's probably a miracle of God. Again, you would need to argue the case. And, you know, that's not that wasn't my case. I, I don't um, care about trying to date the shroud to the historical Jesus as uh, part of my original 300-page chapter when I studied the Shroud. It was solely based on the images themselves and their features. But by all means, I mean, we're interested in God's truth. This is a potential another avenue uh, to argue for the miraculous nature of the Shroud based on historical circumstances. If you think you can prove that it belonged to the historical Jesus, or even if it just belonged to the first century, given... If you add the circumstances that it's obviously meant to portray the Jesus of the Gospels, who would do that in the first century? No, I, I think that entails that it it did in fact belong to the historical Jesus. If it's if the shroud is first century, it's Jesus's shroud in all probability. It's very very improbable that it would have been anybody else who just in the first century happened to look and portray the same situation that Jesus went through in the Gospels. I think that's very unlikely. So, yeah, that, just wanted to mention that. That's a totally aside thing, so um, I'll move on from that front. But uh, moving back into the topic of these medieval documents and the Pilgrim's Badge, as proof that the Shroud Skeptic's premise 2 is correct, the Shroud is probably medieval, I just wanted, so there was this overall thread that I, I thought was kind of weird coming from Hugh. I think he was a little bit off base, uh, although he was he was partially correct, right? So, look, Hugh, Hugh kind of made, look, if the Darcy Memorandum is a fake, uh, what parts of it are fake? You know, and it, it's almost like Hugh is coming up with a false dilemma almost, or you know, trying to push a false dilemma whereby it's an all or nothing type deal. You either accept everything that Darcy said, or you, if you reject it, then you reject everything that Darcy said. And as historians, I think that's ridiculous. I, um, I was hoping Mark Guskin would push back even stronger, very strongly on this. And uh, he did give some pushback and stuff, but no, I mean, historians use the criteria of authenticity all the time. So Mark Guskin mentioned the criteria of multiple independent attestation or criterion of embarrassment or uh, other, you know, the criteria of dissimilarity. Things of this nature are used to glean which parts of a text uh, are authentic, even if we can't adjudicate on other parts of the text. Or even in the case if we have, if we adjudicate and say, well, this part's probably fake. That happens all the time in historical documents dating whether it's the medieval period or the ancient world. So this is no problem. I, I was a little bit perplexed as to why Hugh is trying to seemingly s imply that it's it's one or the other. It's either all or nothing. And that's just totally false, historically speaking. So I myself take the view, look, the only thing that I'm attempting to prove in terms of my undercutting defeater for this evidence, the Darcy Memorandum, is that, look, we can prove that the inquiry 
and whereby the artist confessed to painting the shroud in the medieval period, that's probably false or probably unreliable. We are unwarranted in believing that. And, you know, that's where Mark Guskin came up and others that when we address the other letters, those paper bowls and uh, the back and forth letters between Darcy and the king and Darcy and the pope. And it's just obvious. None of these guys, as even Hugh Ferry admitted, none of these guys had seen the shroud. It, it does, they're, the Pope's contradicting himself. He's going back and forth and changing his mind on certain things. To me, it, he's just playing politics. He's just desperately trying to do what he thinks is right to solve the situation without knowing anything about the authenticity or falsity of the shroud. And in fact, Hugh Ferry even himself provides another plausible explanation as to why the Pope would just mindlessly or unwarrantingly assume the shroud is a fake based on the fourth Lateran council well, oh they we've got to say it's a fake and you know oh we've got these problems with the the fourth crusade in 1204 and people are bringing over byzantine relics and we've got a whole bunch of fake relics as as darcy himself is complaining about and was definitely happening they were swamped in medieval france with fake relics claims and stuff like that so it just makes sense. The Pope would just mindlessly oh, just call it a representation, okay? Ugh, to get this headache away from me. But he didn't have evidence. There was no inquiry that the Pope was aware of, no artist. And in the letters that we have, if there ever was such a thing that took place in the 1350s at some point after Geoffrey I de Charny died, as Hugh wants us to believe, great, there would be records. They would mention in the letters the official proceedings. They would mention in the letters that we do have, and that we, they would appeal to the official inquiry, to the quotes of the artist, to uh, the proceedings that happen, but they don't. There's no mention of an inquiry or an artist or anything in any of these letters. And that, I think, provides us with warrant to disbelieve that part of Darcy's memorandum. Now, us disbelieving and taking away that, that's the source of the warrant that the shroud is, in fact, medieval, and not just that, but it's also an artistic fake. Shroud skeptics do not have provable warrant, and the evidence proves the opposite, that there is no such thing. That, that the inquiry didn't take place, there was no artist who confessed this, and stuff like that. Uh, this was just made up by Bishop Darcy or, or somebody else who wrote this draft. Uh, you don't believe me, Shroud skeptics? Well, go check out Shroud my Shroud panel show number two, uh, where the first hour, uh, even the Shroud skeptic Hugh Ferry himself admits, look, we have no proof that any of these people, the Pope, the anti-Pope, the King, none of these people had ever even seen the Shroud, let alone examined it or heard a confession from an artist. There was, There's no proof of any investigation or inquiry at all. Even Hugh Ferry admitted this. And to my surprise, I'm going to play a little bit of a clip because... We don't even have to go, you know, Hugh Ferry is a sophisticated Shroud skeptic. He's a Shroud expert and knowledgeable. But I was surprised that even fundy lay Shroud skeptics aren't stupid enough to believe, or at least some of them aren't stupid enough to believe that these medieval documents prove the Shroud is medieval and or that uh, it was known because the Pope says to call the Shroud a representation, that therefore it was known that it was... There was an inquiry where the artist confessed to making it and that the shroud was a painting. Now, in this little clip from uh, the after show of Teddy and Hugh Ferry, Teddy Pappas and Hugh Ferry's debate, uh, two skeptics, uh, David Johnson and Darren Lute, are kind of talking with each other. And to my surprise, uh, not to my surprise, David Johnson's making the typical stupid shroud skeptic case, uh, the f typical of Fundy Lay skeptics on the internet. And trying to say, well, everyone in the beginning, all our first documents from the 1350s, again, assuming there's not prior ones, uh, but nonetheless, the documents from the 1350s from the Pope and, and, and that sort of thing call the shroud a representation. It's not until later that we get people saying it's authentic, like what Hugh said in our panel show. Uh, therefore, we can't believe it. And Darren Lute, of all people, uh, as the audience will know, I, I'm not exactly the best friends with this guy because I, I find him to be a stupid skeptic most of the time too. But even he isn't dumb enough to go along with David J. And he actually makes my point for me. So let's listen to these shroud skeptics go at it and prove what I'm saying here. Bishop Darcy, 
question mark. <laughs> so um, I don't know uh, how much you know about Bishop Darcy or if it's necessary to know a lot about Bishop Darcy, but you know, he's the guy who uh, was saying the shroud was fake early on, and I think that mm-hmm. Hugh made a very compelling case. Uh, they all thought it was fake. Um, and Teddy, her only response to that was they were they were being political. You know, they had their internal political reasons uh, for not promoting the shroud. But to me, that is the same as saying they believed it was fake. Uh, because if it doesn't matter what internal political reason you have, if you honestly have the image of Christ on a, you know a burial cloth and you could prove it, uh, and you and you thought that was the case. Uh, you would say so. Yeah, the um, the problem with that kind of logic is that um, you get into conspiracy think- thinking, and there's no way to defend against conspiracy thinking, because no matter what you say, no matter what happens, it all is proof that the conspiracy happened. And you have to remember that the Middle Ages, it, there were there were like, 12 or 13 foreskins of Jesus rolling around in the um, Middle Ages. I think the Catholic Church has like three or four of them. Maybe he was well endowed. (laughs) A few cuts. Yeah, maybe. But uh, 12 foreskins worth? (laughs) (laughs) I'm dubious at best. Um, So, and I think the Catholic Catholic Church has like three or four of them. So it's not like that medieval forgeries weren't prevalent at the time. So to think that this was a medieval forgery was probably the default um, position of anyone in the church just because they were just so prevalent in the Middle Ages. And I'm not entirely sure that um, because they thought it was a forgery that that's really a, um, a compelling argument. Um, well, but what would need to what would need to be added to that is the something that happened later that made them change their mind, uh, because they they knew it was a forgery at least in their minds they knew it was a forgery, and yet they didn't destroy it. They can they continue to use it and keep it for their own purposes. Oh yeah, the Catholic Church is very good at that. They will um, they will keep known forgeries um, all the time because it brings in people and they pretty much in their writings they pretty much say that right and so I I never heard anything that made me get over that hump uh, the people who had it uh, at its earliest thought it was crap uh, and I, I will continue to believe that uh, from not just this discussion but other things that I've read they didn't they didn't buy it <laughs> And oh, you can yeah. say, well, okay, well, they were wrong about it, but when it, but they kept it and they used it even though they knew, or at least in their minds, they knew it was a forgery. And so yeah. I can never trust anything from that source that then might turn around and say, oh, no, no, uh, mea culpa, not a forgery at all, real thing. Keep sending money. Keep touring yeah, no. our city. I don't. I. I can never trust that at that point. And so you might say, well, it's it's not uh, epistemically uh, justifiable to say, well, just because they didn't believe it doesn't mean it's true. But I, it. I, I would also say that because they didn't believe it, it means that I don't have a good reason to believe it either. Um. Yeah, I guess it depends on whether we've got good documentation that they actually examined it, examined it before um, making their decision about it. Um, and that's, that also assumes that they have a reliable means to distinguish a real artifact from a fake one. And we also know that they were perfectly fine touting forgeries, uh, showing off forgeries to bring people into the, the religion. So... Um, yeah, so why should we start sure. believing it was not a forgery? I mean, that's, you know, as and you know the history of the Shroud better than I do. I mean, what is the big turning point in history that 
that makes you think, okay, the Catholic Church knew it was a forgery. They knew it was a forgery. They were using it cynically. And then, oh, wait a minute, this happened. Now um, we should take more notice of it. Um, I don't think there is really any one thing that did it. I think you get enough people believing it that, that it's real, and eventually that's just sort of the bubble that you exist in. And hell has just officially frozen over, folks. Uh, Dar- Dale Glover agrees with the point made by the his arch nemesis, Darren Lute, the fundy lay skeptic from the SNS boards. Uh, bravo, Darren. Thank you for using your brain for once and critically thinking here. Unlike David Johnson, you're absolutely correct. These are utterly meaningless. The fact that the Pope said to call it a representation, number one, as Mark Guskin was saying in our panel show, that does not mean that he was saying it's an error or a fraud or something like that. Um, he's just say, he's just saying don't call it the original Shroud of Christ, not that it's an artistic fake. Uh, get that straight, David J. Secondly, um, as Darren said, look, we have no evidence or proof that they did any examination or had any source of warrant through an inquiry or the confession of an artist at all, bubkis, uh, that that ever took place. So therefore, these people were ignorant and had no right or business to make a claim that the shroud was not authentic or was just a representation. And therefore, we can throw it this evidence in the garbage. Secondly, from these documents themselves, it proves the opposite of what David J and other Shroud skeptics who are of his opinion say, because there's no mention of these inquiry in the letters that we have, proving there wasn't one. Otherwise, they would have to, according to medieval precedent, talk about the, the inquiry and cite, cite from it. And certainly the Darcy Memorandum would cite it um, and give the precise date, not just uh, duh, maybe 34 years ago, I don't know. Um, no, uh, the Bishop Pierre Darcy everywhere else meticulously cites documents and gives the precise date and details as well as quotes um, in his citations when he's proving his cases. He was a meticulous lawyer. He doesn't do he- so here because he was a liar. He was making it up. And that's why the Pope doesn't cite it. Um, so it's just totally meaningless. As uh, I-, I can't believe I'm going to say this as Darren Lute um rightly said here so we we do have positive warrant for believing that on the basis of the evident the absence of evidence because here we would expect it was precedent medieval precedent they always refer to the prior records if there was an official inquiry and stuff like that the pope doesn't mention it darcy doesn't mention it uh in any signed and dated letters that i'm saying uh, the king doesn't mention it. The bailiff doesn't mention it. The baileys are... So it's, yeah, it's there's no inquiry, no artist mentioned in any of these other surrounding documents. And that's telling. Now, does that, does that mean that we're stuck like what he was saying? Oh, I guess we're going to have to believe the shroud was made in... Made by da Vinci in the 15th century or something like that or whatever. Obviously, Hugh doesn't say that because we, we have absolute proof at the very late, early, latest that the Shroud was there at 1390 with the Pilgrim's Badge. And I'll get to that in a second. That's my final point. Um, but no, it's, it's, um, this is, this is kind of ridiculous. We're not just, oh, we're at a total loss to figure out, uh, my goodness, is there a Shroud of Turin that dates to the 13, was there reference to the Shroud of Turin in the 1350s at all? No, uh, of course not. Um, because, I think it's improbable. It's it's implausible that Bishop Darcy or the person who wrote the draft of the Darcy Memorandum would just make up wholesale facts, and it was intended for the Pope and stuff like that, or intended to be an official letter, right, to get something done, and they would just make it up, make this up, when everybody would know the facts about this. If if what Darcy was claiming was true, they were showing the shroud, and they're making all this money, and so many people. Uh, we're coming, obviously this is, uh, historians have said this is an exaggeration and is a lie on Darcy's part anyways, but nonetheless, yes, there, there was traffic, there were showings of the Shroud and that was earning them some money and, and some pilgrims to the point where Darcy became aware of it and annoyed by it, right? Um, so yeah, if he made this obviously false claim 
you know, it, it made up whole cloth that there even was a shroud to begin with or shroud exhibitions, he would have been instantly discredited in a second. You lying fool. Everyone would laugh at him. The Leary Church would say, what are you bumbling on about, you idiot? We have no shroud. Um, okay, so let's, let's get rid of the polemic. The, the point is, I think it's unlikely he would lie about something like that because it would have been, it's like the Apostle Paul, right? He's saying, look, and these guys are still alive. Go check with them. If, if he was just making up whole cloth that there was a shroud of Turin being shown at all in the Leary Church, that would be instantly exposed and discredited by the people once the letter was sent. Um, so there's no, it's just wholly implausible that that would be the case. And for that reason, we have reason to believe that part of the Darcy Memorandum. But at the same time, we can reject the part about the inquiry in the artist, which is the relevant bit of the memo that Shroud skeptics need to rely on to prove the Shroud is a medieval fake or artistic fake. So yeah, that, I just wanted to highlight that. So, so I, I think that that was, even though in the panel review show, I don't think it was, it was clear to everybody what, uh, what was going on there. Uh, so I, hopefully I've kind of clarified this, uh, with my follow-up show by highlighting this aspect, because it was in my head, I was just thinking like, this is just bizarre. And I know that Mark was going back on that and trying to show the flaws in, you know, like, what, what are you saying? Like we, you know, he, he was sort of questioning like what it's not all or nothing, uh, type deal. That's not the way history works. Uh, so I agree with him on that. All right, finally, the last little bit is about uh, something I mentioned about these pilgrims' badges or these pilgrim medallions, uh, something that Alan mentioned in our Shroud Wars round one as a supporting evidence. And one thing I'll, I'll just add on here, uh, Mark Guskin did a great job in appealing to external evidences so that prove Darcy's memorandum is false. And number one, we know it wasn't medieval because we have historical proofs and other proofs that prove that the Shroud dates back centuries earlier than the 1350s. Uh, so Mark Guskin's absolutely right on that. Secondly, Mark Guskin's right. We can disbelieve dis, uh, the part where um, Darcy says it's a, a fake, artistic fake, or a painting, quote-unquote painting, because we have scientific proof, scientifically proven fact, that it's not an artistic painting. We know that for a scientifically proven fact. Um, now, obviously, Hugh takes issue with that, and... Um, he, even though I agree with Mark, these are ways that we can discredit the memo Darcy memorandum evidence um, as a whole, and they are relevant factors to discuss. The fact of the matter is Hugh was right, and it's just because Mark's, he's not a regular guest. So he, did, I, he was right that, look, in the purposes of the panel show, we are kind of restricting our focus to not talk about those prior mentions in Constantinople and before, uh, nor were we looking at the scientific evidence that the Shroud images are not painted. That's a debate for another time or in a different show. So I, I agree with Mark. He was absolutely right to appeal to these external reasons for disavowing the Darcy Memorandum. Um, but he was also right here in that, yeah, but that's, it, it, it's not relevant to the specific show, panel show that we were doing um, at that time. I try to as best I can keep things within silos so that we can evaluate the individual pieces of evidences. But again, that, that's not Mark's fault. I'm glad that he mentioned it, mentioned that because he's right that these factor, external factors are relevant. And again, he, this, was, this was his first time on the show. So I gave him some leeway to speak about it, these other issues a little bit and that sort of thing. But yeah, just uh, wanting, uh, last point is about the medallion. So I asked about this. So this was a supporting evidence. So the first place we have these medallions or pilgrim's badges that sh clearly show the shroud. All sides agree on that. It is the Shroud of Turin. And it dates, uh, basically the pro-shroud claim is, look, there are, co there are no dates on it, but there are coats of arms. And various historians and articles that I've referenced, including the shroud historian Ian Wilson, say, well, the Geoffrey de Charny's coat of arms is first and then Jean de Vergy's. And this is in accordance with French knight medieval practices where the husband has to come first 
and this will date the shroud. So, okay, it must date from the time they were married, between 1349 and 1356, when Geoffrey I de Charny died. Thus dating, we know the shroud was being publicly exhibited at the very latest by 1356, prior to Geoffrey I de Charny's death. And I thought Hugh had a great counter to this, uh, and apparently he said that Ian Wilson has changed his mind uh, on this front, that we can't prove this claim, because what it could be is that after Geoffrey I de Charny died, we have a pilgrim's badge with Jean de Vergy's coat of arms ahead of the husband's, which is, oops, that's not the way it should be, right? So what Hugh was saying is that, well, what happened was the shroud was only showed and these pilgrim badges were shown first in the 13, late 1350s after Geoffrey I was dead uh, and the coat of arms belonged to Geoffrey II, who was a little kitty. Because he was a little kitty, that's why his mom took precedence on that original pilgrim's badge on the coat of, in terms of the coat of arms. But then once Geoffrey II de Charny grew up and became an adult, then they issued new pilgrim's badges to the people coming to see the shroud, whereby the son, uh, as the male knight, took precedence over his mom, Jean de Vergy. And that's what explains these two different uh, coats of arms, according to Hugh Ferry. Now, once again, Hugh makes the, the mention that the pro-shroud historian, an expert Ian Wilson himself, made the original claim and then changed his mind to reflect what Hugh Ferry was saying here. And I have followed up on that, and it does appear to be true. I, so I've posted on my Shroud Panel Review Show Part 2, the blog, right towards the bottom of the recommended sources, I've attached Hugh Ferry's email as, as well as two papers by Ian Wilson explaining his reasons for why he made the change. And I, I it does seem like I'm convinced Hugh Ferry is probably right in terms of his historical hypothesis as to what happened with the switcheroo of these coats of arms, um, with the mother's coat of arms taking precedence over her son's coat of arms when he was a kid in 1356 or 1357 when they first showed the Shroud of Turin publicly. And then around 1389, 1390, they started showing it again. But Geoffrey II was an adult at that time, so his coat of arms then took precedence on these pilgrims badges uh, for the shroud exhibitions and this uh, Ian Wilson says that his change of mind came that it was conclusive in his mind based on what he calls the quote-unquote project Sh Charney um, so these were experts that looked into Jeffrey de Charney and the de Charney family and that sort of thing and uh, Ian Wilson said yeah it looks like what he was saying is true here so okay great uh, take a look at my uh, Shroud Panel Review Show Part 2 for the blogs. There's two papers right at the bottom by Ian Wilson. Uh, and you can read these papers for yourself to see, well, what, what was it that caused Ian Wilson to change his mind on this? I just want to make, clarify, look, either way, the, the medallions or these pilgrims' badges in and of themselves prove nothing. At best, they're just supporting evidence. They prove at the very latest the Shroud was being exhibited in 1390 just as Bishop Darcy said, uh, and or they go back to the 1356. Uh, the shroud was being displayed after the death of Geoffrey I de Charny. You have confirmed that, look, uh, for fa between father and sons, French knights, the coat of arms does pass from father to son. They were unique to individuals, but they do pass to, from father to son. Um, and in this case, you just had the one son, Geoffrey II de Charny. Um, obviously, if he has multiple sons, then they issue out different coats of arms for each of the different sons, and the first son gets the, the daddy's original one. Um, but in this case, yeah, we don't have that problem. So, yeah, his coat of arms could have belonged on the, to Geoffrey II. Remember, with the medallion, it is the shroud skeptic solely bears the burden of proof if he's going to use this to try and prove that the shroud is in fact medieval uh it does not prove that darcy's memorandum is correct it does not prove that the shroud is in was medieval in origin nor does it prove that the shroud of turin was an artistic fake or that there was an inquiry held by henry de portier regarding the shroud of turin at any point um all it does is prove that these guys had the shroud of turin and were doing public exhibitions at some point in between you know, between 1349 and 1390, 
that's all we, that's all we know based on these pilgrims badges and that's fine with me as a pro shroud guy who bears no burden of proof uh, I'm very happy to point out that the shroud that these pieces of evidence are totally useless regardless of which option you go for in terms of how you explain the historical evidence pertaining to the dating of these medallions or the origin of these medallions it's just totally irrelevant either way and at best if it the medallion does if we can prove that the first medallion where the male was a male uh jeffrey de charny was ahead of the woman jean de vergy then that would prove that jeffrey the first de charny was showing the shroud publicly and then then we can say well then the head the letter from Bishop Henry de Portier directly contradicts the Darcy Memorandum. There was no inquiry because Henry de Portier said, Leary Church, great, grand, and groovy. I know you're showing the shroud. I heard all about it. That's cool. Um, in that case, yeah, we would make we can make that argument from the Henry de Portier letter again. And that's why Hugh is coming, trying to come up with an alternative historical hypothesis that no, no, no. Uh, Jeffrey, never, Jeffrey the first never showed the shroud. Once he died, his wife started showing it while Jeffrey the second was a little kitty, uh, and then she mysteriously stopped showing it for because allegedly because of the Darcy inquiry, they stopped showing it, and then all of a sudden they started showing it again in th around thirteen eighty nine to thirteen ninety, peeving off Darcy again, and uh, by that time they started issuing new pilgrims badges with Jeffrey the second to Charney's coat of arms inherited from his daddy, Jeffrey I, ahead of his mummy, uh, Jean de Vergy's coat of arms. That's Hughes Ferry's um, historical hypothesis that he's going for with Ian Wilson's blessing. And the only way that's relevant is kind of trying to defeat anyone who is using the Henry de Portier letter as a defeater for the Darcy Memorandum evidence. But yeah, none of that goes... All of that, I'll just say, let's assume in favor of the Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry. Grant him everything he wants in terms of these medallions. Who cares? Great. I've already said I'm going to stop using the Henry de Portier letter as a defeater for the Darcy Memorandum. Uh, I've got plenty of other defeaters that have been undefeated. So you've you've proven nothing. Uh, so yeah, next. What, what do you have next? Kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, so, so that's my take there. Uh, like I said... It's on the Shroud Skeptic to prove on a balance of probabilities that somehow these medieval documents can establish that there was an inquiry um, where there was an artist who confessed to faking the Shroud, or at the very least, that there is some kind of way to establish the Shroud only came into existence in the 1350s or in the medieval period, and there's nothing like that, uh, nothing that... Hugh can meet his burden of proof in providing proper warrant that is not defeated to establish that claim. So, therefore, I'm back where I started uh, back in 2018. All of this evidence uh, proves nothing. It, it doesn't prove, at best, it doesn't prove one way or the other. You should still be agnostic. Uh, so, yeah, so far the Shroud skeptics are 0 for 2. Carbon 14, utter failure, proves nothing. You're, we're still agnostic? I don't know. It, is the shroud probably medieval or not? These medieval documents and medieval medallions, utter failure again in terms of proving it by the shroud skeptic. Once again, we're agnostic. I don't know. Is the shroud probably medieval or not? Is premise two, two true or false or not? Or true or not? We have no reason so far with these two evidences presented from the shroud skeptic to believe that premise two is true. Okay, with that said, I want to flip gears now uh, for the last thing to mention here is, okay, in our Shroud Solo Show part, panel review part one, we addressed an evidence presented by the pro-Shroud side as a rebutting defeater to premise two. Basically a defeater, a factual defeater that says we can prove as a matter of fact that premise two is false. We can prove that the Shroud is probably not medieval via the Hungarian Prey Codex. And that's going to be the last uh, item that I want to summarize my final opinions after going over the panel reviews on that subject. Okay, so I want to move on to the 
the first pro shroud evidence that we addressed in my shroud panel review show part one. And this was the basically from the Hungarian Prey Codex. And this was presented as an evidence by pro shroud proponents <laughs> to try and prove that premise two of the shroud skeptics argument, namely that the shroud is probably medieval, is in fact false. And the Hungarian Prey Codex is a medieval manuscript uh, or early medieval or uh, around the year 1192 to 1195. And Essentially, uh, the claim is by the pro shroud side that the artist who drew the, that, the pictures on this Hungarian Prey Codex, he used the Shroud of Turin as his basis for that or his inspiration for those images. And again, in the panel reviews, we went into the details. I'm going to go into my own assessment here my set, based on what was said in the Shroud panels. Um, now, the first thing I want to do is just uh, kind of show you guys a table from Tristan Casabianca, um, one of the world's experts in the Shroud of Turin, and show you what he kind of said here. So let me just find this. Okay, yes, I got to share the whole screen. So as you can see, he's, he's written an article that's for free on my blog under Shroud Panel Review Show Part 1. And he's listed all of the Shroud experts, both skeptics and pro-Shroud, as well as agnostics or neutral sources, who've uh, done assessments of the Hungarian Prey Codex. And on the vertical column here, he's listed the various, about 11 features that have been talked about in the literature that are similarities between the Shroud of Turin uh, and the Hungarian Prey Codex, or on the Shroud skeptical side, they are differences that prove that they're not linked. Uh, so you can see uh, the level of the analysis, you know, for example, this Pooley in 2009, he said that he was 95 to 100 percent convinced, proven beyond all reasonable doubt, that the Shroud of Turing was used for the Hungarian Prey Codex, but he only analyzes one out of the 11 features. So it's it's not that good of an analysis. On the other hand, we have um, someone like the uh, art historian uh, Thomas de Wesselo one of the world's experts in 2012, and he covers about nine of the 11 features in great detail. And again, he is 95 to 100% convinced that the Shroud of Turin was used for this. On the other hand, we have the ultimate biased Shroud skeptic, Andrea Nicoletti, who did his analysis in 2020. Uh, he looks at 10 of these 11 features, and he says, well, there's only a zero to 5% probability that the Shroud was used um, for the um, uh, the drawing of the Hungarian Prey Codex. Okay, so so great. So what are what is my take on some of these features? What's my analysis? And I'm going to go over all of these plus additional ones that aren't included in these eleven things uh, listed by Tristan Casabianca. Mine will be the most comprehensive analysis that has ever been done on the Hungarian Prey Codex in terms of the features, uh, and I will be assigning my own subjective probabilities to each of these elements. So let me stop sharing here. Okay, so the way I've done this, there are two images based on one page. So there's uh, an upper panel and then there's a lower panel depicting two different scenes before and after Jesus' resurrection. And I wanna focus first on the, the features of commonality or differences based on the upper panel. So let me just share my screen and show you what we're talking about here. Um, so um, this is um, a picture from uh, the Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry's uh, paid article, which again is available free on my Shroud Panel Review Show Part 1 blog. You can see here's the anointing of Jesus. He's been taken down from the cross. You have presumably Joseph of Arimathea anointing the body with a couple of men. Here's Jesus' body. Resting, there's the Shroud of Turin, or the Shroud, burial shroud underneath him, uh, that looks like it's body length and folded up. And uh, there Jesus is, um, with his uh, arms crossed over his groin, just like the Shroud, thumbs gone, four long fingers. Um, and the pro Shroud side will say, look, this is obvious that the guy who drew this must have seen the Shroud man on the Shroud of Turin. 
and based his portrait of Jesus and how he looks uh, on that basis. And the first major feature that convinces pro shard experts of this is the fact that, look at this, is that Jesus's rumps? Oh my goodness, he's naked. And he is totally naked from head to toe. And this is a huge factor because on the Shroud of Turin, Jesus is portrayed as being totally naked, even uh, kind of, yes, he's covering, covering his uh, groin area, but the backside is fully visible and stuff like that. And this is totally unprecedented and disgraceful in the medieval period to picture, you know, give him a loincloth, cover that up. I mean, he's got to preserve his dignity, right? And 99% of all Byzantine art or Catholic art will depict Jesus somehow being, uh, at, at least in the 1190s and, or earlier, will give him something covering up his modesty. Um, so this is the first aspect that said, well, he must be getting this notion of be Jesus being totally naked. He's not getting it from the surrounding artwork in Byzantine art or Roman Catholic art in the late 12th century, because everyone else gives him a loincloth or something to cover him up. Um, but not here. He's on full display in terms of his backside and rumps and stuff, right? So um, basically, what Shroud skeptics try to do, so in the first place, there's the ultimate Shroud skeptic, and um, Andrea Nicolotti, and he is just ignorant and foolish. He basically lies to the people in his assessment and says, guess what? Oh, these are just commonplace. Jesus is always portrayed as being naked. This is just total lies on his part. Absolutely wrong. Every art historian with a PhD in the entire world says he's wrong and lying. It is extremely rare for Jesus to be depicted naked, fully naked, um, in any Byzantine art from the 1190s or at any time before that. Um, the only exceptions to that, we have some exceptions with some apostles, not Jesus, but some apostles. So let me... Um, show that for a second. Uh, so if I scroll down here, uh, I mentioned this in our panel review show part one. So you got this apostle who's naked and you got this guy covering his groin like Jesus. Um, but outside of that, uh, the Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry even admits that I'm correct about this. Um, hang on, come on, stop sharing. Even Hugh Ferry admitted in the show, no, Andrea Nicolati is, is Full of it. No, it is extremely rare for Jesus to be depicted totally nude, but it ha it does happen. It's not totally unique or totally unprecedented. And there is some truth to this, right? So, for example, we have a lot of um, art of Jesus's baptism scene where he is, in some cases, shown to be fully naked. Um, um, but even these are semi-obscured, right? So Jesus is standing in the water. Yes, he has his manhood on display, but it's it's semi-obscured by the water. Um, so even that they're not fully able to show him just, you know, the, the total package type deal, just front and center for everyone to see. Um, so yeah, I think based on this factor, the total nudity and the, the unabashed um nudity, despite this contradicting the culture and all, all other art at the time. No, nobody had the audacity to just bear all with Jesus. Um, I'm about 60%, my subjective probability value, I would assign about 60% proven that Jesus, uh, the total nudity in the shroud of the shroud man and uh, of Jesus in this Hungarian pre codex proves that they were linked. The guy who made this must have seen the shroud or was aware of uh, these this feature of the Shroud of Turin uh, and the Shroud Man displayed on the Shroud of Turin there. Okay, so next up we have various other uh, commonalities and I'll just show that again. So uh, for example, uh, pro shroud experts will say, well, look, his arms are crossed in over his groin, just like the Shroud of Turin. His thumbs are missing and he's got four elongated fingers, just like the Shroud of Turin. And this is absolutely correct. It, it is an accurate depiction. However, I would say, well, as Hugh said, look at this guy. He's also missing his thumbs, and he's got four elongated fingers. So in that, in that 
context, this isn't surprising or unique. This is a common feature of Byzantine art or, you know, art of this period in the 1192 to 1195 and before as well as afterwards. Um, so I don't think that this proves anything in terms of the lack of thumbs, the long fingers and crossed over the groin. That's a common motif in various images that Hugh is linked to as well. So that's a 50% or less proven thing. I, I don't think we have to say that the Hungarian Prey Codex was made via the Shroud of Turin or the Shroud Man there uh, based on these features. Um, now, another thing to talk about here is stop sharing for a second. Yeah, I was just saying there's another aspect uh, on this upper panel that people link the Shroud to the, the Shroud Man to this image. And if you look, uh, maximum magnification, let me scroll down a bit. Look at this. Ah, he's got an injury on his right forehead. The blood mark, a blood stain there. What that is, it corresponds exactly to the Shroud Man on the Shroud of Turin, his reverse three or epsilon shaped wound on the Shroud of Turin's head. Let me just find a picture of that so you can see what I'm talking about quickly. Um, All right, so here it is. So it's it. This corresponds to this epsilon-shaped bloodstain wound on Jesus's forehead on the Shroud of Turin. Um, perfect match, right? Uh, now I have to admit, um, I think that this is fifty percent or less proven as well. Um, I, yes, it's true. It's on his right side. Remember, this is the Shroud of Turin is a photographic negative, so it, it appears like it's on his the left side of his forehead, but actually it's on the right because the Shroud of Turin as we see it is a photographic negative. So this image would be the, the positive one. But the point is, um, as you can see here, so it, it is on the right side, um, kind of in the center, but it just looks like a smudge to me. I can't make out any trail or an epsilon shape or a reverse three shape. Um, and for that, that reason, I, I don't think we can prove anything based on this mark and say that it definitely came from the Shroud of Turin. Uh, I think the Pro Shroud guys are kind of stretching it um, on that front. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next feature then. And just before I do that, going back to Jesus's nakedness as depicted, I mentioned that there were some scenes of Jesus's baptism where he's portrayed naked. So, you know, here's an example in Arian, ancient Arian art, the heretics, the Arian, Arianism, uh, proponents of Arianism, right? They show Jesus here, he's naked, but he's obscured by the water a bit. Um, or in this picture, again, a baptism scene, he's obscured by the water, um, and so on and so forth. Here's this one, same deal, right? So this is what Hugh Ferry is talking about, but this is a totally different scene, and it's not relevant to the portrayals in within uh, Christian iconography or art uh, from the 12th, late 12th century or earlier, uh, depicting the anointing of Jesus. He's never naked there. I don't. There are no examples of that until after um, the 1190s. Um, so in that case, it is totally unprecedented, from my understanding, to depict Jesus uh, totally naked in uh, that particular scene. And let me just uh, do a quick scan here. I think there is something I wanted to read. Hang on one second on that front. Oh, yeah. So the closest representation, I mentioned this, um, during the scourging, one can think of two early dorsal representations of naked Jesus, the Psalter of Urit and the Psalter of Stugart. The deposition of the cross of the Prey Codex by the same author, but of better artistic quality, depicts a dressed Jesus with traces of violence and a thumb of the right hand as well. And here's the quote, the relevant part, the closest representation of nudity in the 12th century. So this is when the Hungarian Prey Codex was made, or earlier, is probably found in Berzelaville, France. It does not represent the crucified Jesus, but instead the martyrdom of St. Vincent of Saragossa, naked upon a grill with his legs held tight. Um, at, the 
And then he goes on, uh, Tristan goes on and quotes, at the beginning of the 14th century, there was a gradual move toward total nudity. In the representations of the crucifixion, Jesus' nudity, nudity only appears around 1330 in the uh, folio 32 of the Holcam Bible. And for the post-crucifixion Christ, only at the beginning of the 15th century do we finally get naked Jesus. So this begs the question, why would the Prey Codex uh, artist decide or and or be asked to take this degree of theological liberty centuries before anyone else had the audacity to paint Jesus totally naked, but naked, literally, um, in his post-crucifixion scene when nobody else did that? Uh, yeah, so in that way, it is totally unprecedented and I think rather important. So. As I said, uh, moving on to the next feature, uh, let me just share my screen here. Okay, so the next feature was something brought up by the Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry, and it's, well, look at this uh, body of Jesus here. Other than this weird little wound up here, where are all his scourge wounds? I, uh, these lines are represent muscles. I, I don't see any scourge wounds at all. Um, so obviously that's a disanalogous to the shroud. This is the first counter feature. Shroud skeptics will say, well, there's a difference. There's no, the shroud man has a lot of bloody scourge wounds. This guy has nothing. So obviously the guy who drew this wasn't using the shroud of Turin as his inspiration. Well, all I can say to that is actually that's too assumptive and totally proven ridiculous as a counter argument. He could have seen the shroud and not painted the scourge wounds. We have no zero provable expectation that we would expect to see scourge wounds. Let me prove it using Hugh Ferry's uh, in-depth and great research itself. So in this very paper, um, uh, hang on a second, on page uh, 10 to 12, page 10 to 12 of 15, let's take a look. Um, look at this, here's Jesus in artwork. Where are the scourge wounds? I don't see them. I don't understand. Did this guy not read his gospels and hear that Jesus was scourged? Wouldn't we expect him? But yet they don't do it. Um, oh, another picture from thanks to Hugh Ferry. Where are the scourge wounds? I don't see them. No problem. Uh, where are the scourge wounds on this depiction of Jesus? Totally gone. Um, and not only that, guess what? What's even more the case? Thanks to uh, in Hugh Ferry's Shroud Skeptical write-up, Medieval Shroud Part 3, look at this. These are actual paintings dating to the hundreds of years after the 1300s, copying the Shroud of Turin. Historically, we know these are copies of the Shroud of Turin. How do I know? The Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry has done my work and shown them. Where are the scourge wounds on these? I don't understand. We know for a fact these are copies, but... Yet, for some reason, this guy's got a loincloth, he's not totally naked, and there's no scourge wounds, and it's not a problem. Hugh Ferry believes these are definitely copies of the Shroud of Turin. Well, it could be the same with the Hungarian guy. For whatever reason, they didn't put on um, any wounds. Um, so it, these famous photos, where are the scourge wounds? I don't see them. Um... Yep, here are, the, here are the images on the cloth. Again, no scourge wounds are evident. So it's it's just, it's provably false. The, fault, the assumption that shroud skeptics like Hugh Ferrer are making that, well, if the artist of the Hungarian Prey Codex saw the Shroud of Turin, that he has to put on, uh, has to put on uh, scourge wounds there. We, I mean, we have paint, we have deliberate paintings and of the Shroud of Turin, no, no one doubts that. Even Hugh Ferry's presenting these that are directly copies of the Shroud of Turin and the images on the Shroud, and yet no bloodstains, no copies of, uh, of scourge wounds at all. So that's the problem with inserting our modern expectations in anachronistically to historical settings. You know, well, heck, we would expect to talk about that or, or to depict that. Well, that's not necessarily the case for these ancient artists in the medieval period or even up to the 1600s who had pictures there. So I think this is a totally failed shroud skeptical counter feature. The lack of scourge wounds proves nothing in terms of this being a, a copy of the Shroud of Turin or based on the Shroud Man of the Shroud of Turin or not. 
Okay, next, uh, we'll go to the next uh, counter feature. So hang on one second. Oops. That's not what I want to do. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, so the last counter feature by the Shroud Skeptics was one that we kind of talked about where Hugh Ferry on Panel Review Show Part 1 said, well, look at it, there's no beard. Obviously, if this guy saw the Shroud, there should be a beard. Well, let's look at, again, from Hugh Ferry's own paper and do 500% magnification. Both Bob and every scholar were right. There is a beard there. It's obvious. Look at these lines. That's a beard. And there's this little mustache kind of thing. So there's no doubt that the Hungarian Prey Codex does depict Jesus with a beard. Even the hyper shroud skeptic Andrea Nicoletti admits there's a beard, but his objection is that, but it's not a, a long uh, bifid beard like the Shroud of Turin portrays, right? So I think that the, the claim of Fufer, he was a little bit sloppy in trying to say, well, when it's zoomed out, it looks like there's no beard. Yeah, but when you zoom in, you can obviously see the lines. There is a beard, like Bob Rucker said. Here's the problem. It's a short beard. It is not a long beard like the, the other guys obviously have. He's capable of drawing longer beards, and nor is it a bifid beard like the Shroud of Turin. Now, with in terms of Nicoletti, I, it doesn't matter to me that it's not a bifid beard. Again, this artist is he saw the shroud maybe once or once or something like that, or or even uh and is basing it on memory. And for that reason, he doesn't draw it the draw the bifid beard that's easily explainable i do still struggle with the fact that it's a short beard and not a long beard i think that the shroud skeptic you fairy does have a point that personally i think we would expect if this guy did see the shroud of Turin, even if he's basing it on memory he would give him a long beard um now obviously to counter that maybe there's some reason why he depicts him with a short beard while the artist gives the the guys up top longer beards um, I don't know, maybe he himself, the artist himself had a short beard. He's like, I want Jesus to look like me or something. Uh, who knows? We, we can postulate anything we want. However, I will um, admit, and son of a gun, I wasn't sharing my screen. Okay, so let me just share the screen. So as you can see, here's what I'm talking about. 500% magnification from Hugh Fairies. There's the beard. You can see the lines and the mustache and stuff like that. So he does have this short beard that I'm talking about here. But I think he, he was right um, to say it should, we would expect it to be a long beard if this is based on memory of the Shroud of Turin. Um, again, you can come up with counters like saying, well, the artist, he had a short beard and wanted Jesus to look like him, or he had some other reason to give Jesus a short beard compared to the other, the other guys who have the long beard. And I'll just scroll up, see, they can draw long beards as well. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I, I think that Hugh is right. Um, I will say on the base, this basis, I'm about 65% convinced that the artist of the Hungarian Prey Codex, on the basis of the short beard, uh, did not use the Shroud of Turin or the Shroud Man as inspiration. Uh, the Shroud Skeptic wins this round, this counter feature. Okay, so, so that's literally it in terms of the, um, in terms of the, uh upper panel so we have basically two four features in total two uh pro shroud features and then two counter features presented by the shroud skeptics in terms of the you know i i combined everything so the arms crossed over the groin the four long elongated fingers with no thumbs being visible and finally the red epsilon wound or smudge on the head of the of Jesus on the Hungarian Prey Codex on the right side, the proper side, as Jesus's epsilon wound on the Shroud of Turin, I assigned fifty percent or less. And again, fifty percent or less equals a, a failure. If if in terms of Bayesian logic, right, anything that's not more than fifty percent, more probable than not, does not contribute to the calculation. If you have less than fifty percent and you include that, that means that you're saying, well there's a different hypothesis. You're saying it's false because, because um, Jesus has armed, arms crossed over the groin. That proves that it's false that he used the Shroud of Trin. Well, that's obviously not what we're saying. So, so this is why I say look, 50% or less means that it's irrelevant. Yes, he's got the arms crossed over the groin. 
It's the same as the Shroud of Trin. Cool. Well, that doesn't prove the Shroud wasn't used. Obviously not that. But there's no proof that he probably did use the Shroud. And so in that sense, we simply have to ignore this factor from our final Bayesian calculation to get our cumulative probability on the basis of these upper panel features. So, so that's what I'm saying again, just to remind you. Um, okay, so all those factors or commonalities uh, were 50% or less. We ignore them from our final calculation. Uh, next, the Shroud skeptical counter feature about there being no scourge wounds, utterly falsified and disproved. It doesn't prove anything. He, he could have lacked these scourge wounds and still drawn it that way because we have actual copies, historically proven copies that Shroud skeptic Hugh Ferry himself has pointed out in his own papers and yet they don't depict any scourge wounds or blood marks at all. So that's totally irrelevant. It's just ancients were weird, I guess. They don't do what we expect them. Medieval people don't do what we expect. Our, our modern expectations should not should be properly calibrated. And in this case, the Shroud skeptics are totally out of whack with these medieval painters. Um, now, we did have one pro-Shroud feature that did work, namely Jesus' total nudity. I do think that probably proves the shroud was used, and I assigned 60%. On the other hand, we also have one shroud skeptical counterfeature, namely the, the fact that Jesus has is depicted with a short beard on the Hungarian prey codex instead of a long bifid beard, or at the very least a long beard. Um, I think that disproves that the shroud was used on a balance of probabilities. I'm about 65% convinced about that. Well, when plugging that in those numbers into Bayes' theorem, that means our total cumulative case in terms of the upper panel being based on the Shroud of Turin in isolation, so excluding any features from the bottom panel, is only 44.68% probable. And let me just uh, pop up my calculations there so you can kind of see what I'm what I was doing, right? So you can see here. So yeah, like I said, 65 for the the no long beard, 50% or less. So these, these ones are ignored. And then 60% for the total nudity. When you plug that into Bayes' theorem to get the cumulative probability, 44.68% proven that the shroud was used for the upper panel when considering these four features in isolation. Oh, oops. Oh my goodness. Um, but Dale, you're pro shroud. Well, here I'm agreeing with the shroud skeptic. It, I think it's improbable that the Shroud of Turin was used for the upper panel if given the fact that all we have to consider is those are those features, the above features from the upper panel itself, from this image uh, alone type deal. Well, thankfully for our uh, pro Shroud people in the audience, the upper panel is not the only thing that we have. We also have the lower panel. And there are several features and counter features relevant to the lower panel that we're going to have to take into our cumulative case assessment as well. So let me get into that next. Uh, let me just stop sharing. And OK, so let's move on now to the bottom panel. And that's what you're seeing here up on your screen, again, from Hugh Ferry's own paper. And you can see this is the post-resurrection scene. Um, you have the angel announcing to the three women coming to Jesus' tomb. This is presumably Mary. And they're te he's telling the women, guess what? He's raised and he's pointing to the empty shroud cloth, the shroud of Turin. Um, or uh, is he pointing to the empty tomb? And this is the shroud cloth. Um, as Basically, we're going to find out there's a difference. So let's start with the pro shroud claim, right? So this depiction, this is the shroud cloth. This is the underneath, and you have the red crosses representing blood stains. Then you have the top of the shroud with the herringbone weave and the L-shaped holes, uh, and then you have this little crumbled up bit on top. Um, according in the panel reviews, Bob Rucker said here is a knife. And then here's the face of the Shroud of Turin, uh, the face cloth representing Jesus' face with his beard sticking down, his mouth, the nose, and the eyes. Uh, and then there's his forehead. Um, so that in a nut and this is the blood belt. So that in a nutshell is the pro-shroud side. 
the shroud skeptics look at this and interpret it entirely different. They'll say, uh, no, this is actually the tomb. So here's Hugh Ferry breaking it up in a bit. So B, this is the side of the tomb. A, this is the uh, lid of the tomb, slightly askew. C, the crumpled up bit, that's the shroud. Uh, and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's a totally radically different interpretation of this bottom panel image. Now, I want to go into my assessment as to why do I think that this image is, in fact, the pro show guys are right. This is depicting the Shroud of Turin, not a tomb. And uh, on a balance of probabilities, how do I link that showing that this guy who painted this or drew this must have seen the Shroud Man, or the Shroud of Turin, uh, in making this image? Okay, so the first aspect that I want to concentrate on uh, is obviously the red crosses here that our pro guys say no that represents the blood stains uh, on the shroud of turin and as uh, teddy pappas says here's a quote from one of her comments on my videos she says quote unquote now what do we make of those red crosses artistically this is symbolic i suspect of showing us that this portion of the cloth which would be the inner portion of the shroud that would have been in direct contact with Christ's body and bloodstains was the portion that first absorbed the salvific, continuously red-ish blood of Christ that was shed during the Passion, which would have, of course, included the crucifixion. So, yeah, they're in the shapes of crosses. These don't look like bloodstains on the face of it. At face value, I kind of was skeptical of this myself when I heard Pro Shred Guy saying it. No, these look like crosses, right? Not blood stains. And uh, what Teddy is saying, along with Bob Rucker and other pro shred experts and myself, we would say, well, that's because they're symbolic. Um, okay, so here's here's the counter for these red crosses. Hugh Ferry, he will say, no, this is obviously the side of the tomb. Look, we have lots of examples of sides of tombs with crosses on them. So here's his little picture here. There you go. There's the tomb with engraved the crusaders put on a wall of crosses well that's what they did to the tomb um just like they did here at the holy sepulcher that's what those red crosses are representing well here here's here's a problem they're not red right the why are these for god's green earth on god's green earth colored red and that's really the the key for me as to why I think that this is probably meant to portray blood and it's, you know, the crosses is a symbolic gesture. You put them in the bloodstains in the form of red crosses. And this isn't totally unprecedented. Thanks to Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry doing all my work for me. Um, if we see in his own paper, uh, page 36 out of 105 of the medieval shroud, we can get a glimpse of Jesus being portrayed with wounds, scourge wounds, that do look like red crosses from afar. Look, there's like a little smudge there. It looks like a T. Nah, you know, got some T's there, crosses there, crosses there. From, from a distance, it, it can look like red crosses on his body kind of thing. So I think that's what they could be depicting. You know, you got the cross of the T there. Cross of the T there, cross of the T there. Um, now, obviously, if you if you look close enough, you realize they're not red crosses, right? These are just blood wound, and then it's dripping off. Perhaps there's a little smudge for some of them at the top. But the point is, they do look like red crosses, and perhaps some people, some artists, uh, use that uh, to say, oh, well, that's, they got the idea to use red crosses as a symbol for Jesus' bloodstains uh, because they were sacred and holy, and that's what atoned for everybody's sins. Um, so yeah, that that's just, I wanted to show that just to suggest a pl historically plausible scenario as to why there would be uh, bloodstains, but depicted as red crosses on the Hungarian uh, Prey Codex itself here. Um, okay, great. So again, this is a weak argument. I, I would assign it 60% in favor of the pro shroud side. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next feature then.
And this is obviously, look at the cloth. There's that three to one herringbone weave that's unique to the Shroud of Turin. As uh, Dr. Methchild Fleurilin Berg herself uh, said, this proves that the guy who made the Hungarian Prey Codex, who drew this bottom panel here, must have seen the Shroud of Turin. Let, let's take a listen to what she said in her own words. Hold on one second while I pull her up. Uh, I got to pause. Okay. okay, here's a little clip from a BBC documentary with the world's renowned textile expert, Dr. Methchild Fleurilin Berg, talking about the Hungarian Prey Codex. Uh, she was the one in charge of the 2002 restoration project for the Shroud of Turin. She's examined it with her own eyes. She's such a world's expert uh, in textiles and understanding the cloth and the weaves of cloths and that sort of thing that uh, she was actually considered and wanted to come for the 1988 carbon-14 dating test by these the godless atheists and shroud skeptics who wanted to carbon date it um, in order to pick where the sample is from. So she, all sides admit she is an expert. You've got to listen to what she says. You don't have to always agree with her. We don't appeal to authority, but uh, it is strong evidence that you need to consider her opinion. So let's hear this little clip part. The evidence for a 12th century shroud of Christ surfaced recently in a document called the Prey Manuscript. It's in Hungary and takes its name from the scholar who first examined it. It can be reliably dated to 1196. This is one of its five illustrations and it shows Jesus being placed in his burial shroud. Methil Fleury Lemberg is a textile expert who is charged with preserving the fabric of the shroud. She studied these images of Christ in the manuscripts and identified a number of features that reappear on the Turin shroud. The most obvious is that the figure on the shroud has the arms crossed and the thumb hidden under the hand. On the top, you see the painting with the corpse laying on a white linen, as one would expect, which is normal, a white linen. And you see the arms crossed, and you see the four fingers. The thumb is uh, invisible, is hidden. And that is also a connection. It's also visible in the same on the shroud. Lemberg is also very aware of the geometric weave of the shroud. What is more important for a textile historian as I am, is you see painted herringbone pattern. And this herringbone pattern is a typical sign of the shroud of Korean. Another feature of the cloth are the holes bunched together in an L shape. These holes here, these L holes, they are on this picture and they are on the shroud four times because it was folded in four layers. You see here yeah. small holes, a little bit bigger, and then here you see the bigger ones. Oh, I see. This painter of this picture must have seen the Shroud of Turin. Otherwise, it's not possible because it's exactly the signs which we find also on the Shroud in Turin. All right, so that's, uh, so that's the clip that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, Dr. Metschow Freelenberg saying it's not possible that some somebody had not seen the Shroud and painted the Hungarian Prey Codex. Now, obviously, as Hugh Ferry, the Shroud skeptic, is right. He's kind of scolded me in the past um, by saying, well, yeah, but uh, she's a textile historian expert. So that's her expertise. She's not an expertise in art history and stuff like that. Nonetheless, as a textile historian, she would speak to the weave of the cloth. She mentioned this is the herringbone weave is copied on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, sorry, is copied on the Hungarian Prey Codex from the Shroud of Turin. And that's the part that I want to focus on here. Uh, just bring it up again. So there we go. Is this weave pattern that we see? Uh, obviously, this is copying the the weave pattern from the Shroud of Turin. That's unique to it, and it's very interesting. That this guy's drawing this. Now, just uh, in terms of an objection, the Shroud Skeptic Q Fairy on our panel review show part one uh, and part three, he kind of raised 
but this isn't uh, what we'd expect. This isn't depicting a herringbone weave. Instead, it's like a step stair ladder kind of thing. And this is not consistent with the herringbone weave. So obviously he's not drawing the shroud. The, the world renowned textile historian was wrong, obviously. And this is where um, Bob Rucker kind of came in and said, no, this is exactly, Nutshell Fleur Lindbergh was correct. This is exactly consistent with the herringbone pattern that we see on the Shroud of Turin. And he showed us in my Shroud Panel Review Show Part 3, when we kind of revisited the Hungarian Prey Codex, he showed us uh, where he's identified these step stair patterns on the Shroud itself. So just give me a second. I'm going to bring up uh, both those clips for you guys. So stop sharing for a second. Okay, so here are the clips. Uh, so this is the first clip where Hugh Ferry is making his skeptical counter to the claim that this represents the herringbone weave. Uh, let's hear what Hugh has to say. Now, uh, and then the other thing is people people see some zigzag. Now, anybody who knows the design of the shroud, such as the people who produced the pilgrim uh, badges, um, when the shroud was first uh, uh, appeared in, in Leary, we'll know that the herringbone looks like this. It's, it's simply not possible to do it any other way. And if I was to ask anybody to draw some a cloth with herringbone design on it, I submit that this is simply not what they would do. You see what I'm doing here? This is not a drawing of some herringbone cloth, and yet it is exactly what they were doing on the Prey manuscript. Now, it's a moot point as to what it was meant to represent, but it certainly wasn't meant to, went, meant to represent herringbone. I... So there you go. Yeah, he was appealing to that stair step model and saying that's not how you would draw the herringbone weave. Well, uh, let's hear Bob Rucker on Shroud Panel Review Show Part 3, where he proves that that's false. I think that's what we have here. There's one thing where this slide shows where I would identify the stair step arrangement. In the completed one, herringbone 12 weave of the Shroud of Truth. So there you there you have it. So yeah, I don't I I understand what Hugh's saying, but I don't think it uh, it ends up working type deal uh, in terms of a refutation of the herringbone weave. Again, uh, textile experts agree that this is the weave of all persuasions. Um, a lot, of, you know, as said, there have been several studies in the 21st century, even by agnostics or non-believers, non-pro shroud people, who admitted this is the herringbone weave. Um, so therefore, I assign, I'm about 70% convinced that this is, in fact, representing the herringbone weave from the Shroud of Turin. Um, I'm not convinced by um, Shroud skeptics who say that it's it's not. I know Hugh has kind of offered in his paper uh, that it might be a representation of Onk's on uh, marble. Let me bring that up here. Um, let me bring that uh, so he, here you go. So, you know, he says, oh, it might be this onks marble is what's trying to be represented. But that that does not look like a stair step pattern at all. So, I, yeah, I, I just don't believe. Why does it look like that? I just don't believe. Uh, Hughes claims on that front. Um, let me try to fix this for a second. Okay, so here with uh, now it's fixed. So this is the Onks marble that uh, Hugh postulates maybe uh, what's trying to be depicted here with these stair step things. I don't see it personally. And Bob Rucker has proven on the actual Shroud of Trin, we can see this stair step uh, shapes that come about uh, from looking at the Shroud of Trin's herringbone pattern. So, and these patterns were visible with the naked eye, as even Andrea Nicoletti admits, as the famous hard entrenched shroud skeptic. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my take on the herringbone weave. I'm about 70% convinced that proves the shroud. Now, uh, the next thing to get into are the most famous pro shroud case, 
the L-shaped poker holes and the de decorative circles aspect. And on this front, I still remain that this is the strongest pro shroud case or aspect that we have to link the uh, Shroud of Turin with the Hungarian Prey Codex. So if you see, I'm going to zoom in here. On this bottom panel, you have these L-shaped holes, right? This corresponds pretty well with the Shroud of Turin um, because the Shroud of Turin has these L-shaped poker holes that you saw in my Shroud panel review show uh, part. Uh, there it is. There's what they look like on the Shroud of Turin itself. Um, so yeah, the, these fit pretty darn well. Now, he was quick to point out, yeah, but they're disproportional and they're not exactly in the same position that it is on the shroud. Again, the artist was basing it on memory. The fact is, these holes stuck out to him as distinctive features, and he got it about right as to how it looks on the Shroud of Turin. So in terms of explaining these, even Hugh Ferry admits these are not decorative. They serve no obvious function. They are a mystery. He doesn't know how to explain these. Um, and he tried and he said, well, maybe, maybe they are. So shroud skeptics have tried. So in the first place, Andrea Nicoletti tries to say that, well, these are oculi. These are holes that you can look and in, look into the tomb and see the body or something. Total ridiculous. Absolutely historically falsified. Oculi come in threes and they are in a distinct horizontal pattern. So these are not oculi. Uh, Nicoletti is out to lunch. Um, now Hugh Ferry says, well, maybe these are holes for pegs. Well, I just want to say, and he admits, look, this is just tentative. He can't prove it, and he doesn't expect to convince anyone because it sounds nuts, but it's just the best that he can think up because he's in a tough spot as to how to explain these L-shaped holes if it's not the shroud, based on the shroud of Turin's L-shaped holes. One thing he does say, he says, well, look at the bottom. This is, according to Hugh Ferry, the side of the tomb, and if these are supposed to be the L-shaped holes, well, it's not in an L-shape on the bottom here, right? And here's where we just have to admit, this artist sucked. He was geographic, geometrically challenged, as Bob Rucker puts it. Look, he's got his red crosses here, and he doesn't know how to put an L-shape in. Um, it's just because he sucks as an artist. As everybody agrees, this is a bad drawing, even by medieval standards in the late 12th century. He's not the best. That, that's all that is. It's simple as that. These are L, representing the L-shaped holes just like here, but he didn't figure out maybe I should draw the L-shaped holes first and then put on my crosses or something like that. Um, so that's all that is. Um, and another thing shrouds, some shroud skeptics try to say is they'll say, well, look, up here you've got the circles and you've got the circles on the angel's wing. Therefore, these must just be decorations like these circles are. Well, even Hugh Ferry said that's total nonsense. These circles obviously portray decorations on the wings or on the belts or on the woman's dress. They serve no purpose. Just having four L-shaped holes right here in the, randomly in the middle of the nowhere doesn't make any sense. Now, one thing I want to raise against Hugh Ferry's suggestion that, well, these are holes for the pegs. Okay, so according to Hugh Ferry, this is the tomb's lid. So that means the pegs would go down vertical to seal it to the tomb, right? But these hole, this is the side of the tomb, not the bottom of it. So why do we have holes going horizontally in the sides? So there's pegs vertically and pegs through the sides? That doesn't make sense to me. That disproves Hugh's hypothesis, in my opinion. Um, if this was the bottom of the tomb, maybe you could say, okay, there's holes for pegs vertically uh, up and down. But that doesn't work because this is a horizontal view for the tomb, whereas this is representing the pegs would go in vertically through the tomb's lid, if what, Shrab, if what Hugh Ferry was saying was correct. So I don't think that works. No, I think it's better to say, look, this is the Shroud of Turin folded with the underside, and these are representing the L-shaped holes, uh, the four sets of L-shaped holes, because it was folded when these holes were formed. Uh, present on the Shroud of Turin. And I'm always being generous to the Shroud skeptic, but I would say I'm about 75 to 80% convinced that these L-shaped holes prove the Hungarian Prey Codex is based on the Shroud of Turin. And I always assign the worst for the pro-Shroud side. So 75% proven on this front. Um, okay, great. So let's 
move on to the next uh, feature then. So the next feature that we have here is, oh, uh, so on my Shroud Panel Review Show Part 3, Russ Brault was on as a Pro Shroud expert, and he mentioned, well, look at this thing. Assuming this is the Shroud of Trend, look at the dimensions, or a burial cloth. Look at the dimensions. It's disproportionate. I mean, any schmuck could buy a burial shroud online today, and you'll see that the proportions are way out of whack. It's way too long and that sort of thing. And Hugh Ferry has mentioned this about the Shroud of Turin uniquely. It's it's not really a burial cloth. It, it's obvious a cloth that was used for something else that I guess because Joseph of Arimathea must have had, and because he was in a rush to bury Jesus, he used that to bury Jesus instead of having a proper burial shroud. It was good enough. We got to get him in the in the tomb before sundown type deal. So we'll use this cloth. Um, so that's what I think happened. And Russ is saying, well, look, this is the Hungarian pre-codex is portraying the cloth as elongated and not in a proper burial shroud proportions. Um, now, what do I have to say about this? I'll, I'll just say, I think this, uh, with all due respect to Russ Brault, it is a failure as an argument. It's 50% or less proven that it's the case or, or demonstrates that the shroud is in fact the impetus for this drawing. So, so number one, think about it. We have the upper panel where the shroud is depicted and it's not, it doesn't have the disproportional proportionality uh, up here. Um, so that's a bit, that doesn't fit what Russ is interpreting here. Um, again, that's the upper panel. So maybe he just wasn't thinking about it until he got to this part. But also it, it's begging the question that this is the cloth. And as again, the shroud skeptics will say, no, this is the tomb. And this part is the tomb lid. Uh, so of course it's not proportioned like a burial shroud. Um, and we just have no way of proving one way or the other. On, in this sense, it is the pro shroud guy that bears the burden of proof for this aspect or this claim. And I don't think we can prove that, yeah, he, he's copying the shroud's disproportionate dimensions here. So yeah, we're gonna end with that. Um, okay, next feature, the blood belt. Bada boom, bada bing, look at this. Um, the Shroud of Turin uniquely has a blood belt across the middle of the Shroud Man's back on the dorsal side. Um, and it uh, looks like, let me uh, try to find an image for you guys to show you that. All right, so um, as you can see, here's the blood belt across the back, get out of here, across the back of the Shroud of Turin, right? Um, so this is what is referred to as the blood belt by people. Um, and according to pro shroud experts, they'll say, well, that's evident as portrayed by here on the Hungarian Prey Codex. And the shroud skeptic Hugh Ferry um, tried to dismiss this evidence and say, well, in the first place, it's not in, exactly in the center like it should be, right? So remember, the, according to the pro shroud guys, this is the shroud and then it's folded at this point towards the center. And then this is the dorsal side image from the inside view. And that's why this side has the blood stains, but it's not on top here. Um, but there is this blood thing right here about the middle of the Shroud of Turin, but it's not intertwining and it's not where it should be. Well, guess why it's not where it, the angel is sitting there. Again, this artist is not a good artist and he's geometrically challenged as Bob Rucker's said, and we all agree he sucks, right? So I think he was just doing his best to portray the blood stain, the blood belt right here. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't, and the fact that they're not intertwined, again, it's based on memory. He just remembered there was some weird blood stain that caught his attention that we call the blood belt, and he wanted to portray that. Um, so yeah, in terms of that aspect, uh, I think that's a success. I'm about 65% proven that that is in fact uh, the meant to represent the Shroud of Turin's blood, blood belt. Um, let me just read. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Hugh, Hugh wants to say this is just probably some kind of fringe design, design or something to make it look good. I don't think so. That's that's clearly not what he has in mind, just based on the position and the randomness. Why are they red? Um, or the rest of the cloth is not colored red. Um, yeah, I, I don't think he's trying to depict, depict some fringe decoration or something like that. It's clear this is meant to be some kind of blood stain. And it just happens to correspond almost to what we have with the Shroud of Turin's blood belt. So uh, on that front, I am 65% proven. Okay, so the next aspect that I wanted to talk about. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so this is um, Bob Rucker's notion that, um, still sharing, hopefully. There's uh here so here's part of the shroud disheveled right this crumpled up mess. Hugh Ferry the shroud skeptic says no this is the entire shroud sitting on top of the tomb's lid. Pro shroud experts say well no this is either as Teddy Pappas says this is supposed to represent the head cloth this crumpled up bit. Um, I don't think that's that is what it's trying to do from looking at other Byzantine pictures but. Um, Bob Rucker mentioned, well, look, here's a knife right here, and it cut the shroud, and here's the part that it cut out, meant to be Jesus's face, and Mary's holding it up. There's his eyes, forehead, nose, his mush, and elongated for his little beard there, his short beard, which looks a little too long here. Um... This was something that was totally new to me and to Hugh Ferry, the Shroud Skeptic, on our panel review show part one. And so I wanted to look into this because I, I think it is compelling, um, it, it, at least at face value when I first hear it. Um, yeah, it seems to make sense to me. Um, and this definitely looks like a knife. Now I'm going to do a close up, though. And I think that Bob Rucker is actually mistaken. So. This is not a knife. If let's go to maximum magnification. This is what's called the knife. Look at it. It's the blade is bending around. It, it's clear to me that this is just another linen strip that's disheveled and going out. Because if it was a knife, the, the blade wouldn't bend or be curved like that. Uh, so unfortunately, as much as I liked Bob Rucker's notion, I think it's probably false. At this point, this is this part is definitely not a knife. Now, absent the knife, could it be that Bob's general theory is correct and that, yeah, this is a part of the shroud that's disheveled and they have cut off, even though they don't show a knife, they have cut off the face to give to Mary. I don't know, maybe that that could be true. It sounds equally sounds plausible to me. But I don't think we as the pro shroud guys who have the burden of proof can prove one way or the other. It, it sounds, number one, I think Hugh Ferry's right that us seeing the face here, it, it doesn't correspond to Jesus' face in the upper panel. Uh, let's go upper panel. It doesn't seem to correlate. It looks almost cartoonishly big on the chin. And again, Jesus is portrayed with a short beard, not a long beard. So this doesn't make sense. So I just think this could be equally explained by pareidolia, a natural phenomenon where we want to see faces. You know, we saw the face on the on Mars and stuff like that when there, it's not there. It's all in our head. And I, I think he was right to say pareidolia could explain this, or at least it's an equally plausible or probable explanation. And I'll be honest, I never saw this face until Bob mentioned it that day on the show. Um, so, so yeah, it kind of now it's stuck in my head. I can never get rid of that sight. Um, but the fact that I never even noticed it until he mentioned it, I do think is telling that it's probably a psychological mechanism, or, or at the very least, that's equally probable to explain this. This is definitely not a knife. Um, so yeah, we're we're left with okay, this crumpled up heap. Is this a part of the shroud, or is it the shroud sitting on a tomb lid? And again, I, I'm assigning 50% or less that it's equally probable. I, I will say this, that it does look like the strips, I guess you could say, well, these are coming out from the thing, but it does look like they're almost a part of the cloth, right? These two strips coming and then it's disheveled. 
possibly because someone's cut out the face cloth, as Bob is saying. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm I just don't know. I'm agnostic personally about Bob Brooker's theory about the face and cutting out the face from the shroud images. Um, one thing for sure is the strongest piece of evidence that made me think it was more probable than not was the fact that it, when you look from afar, like, yeah, this is the knife. But then when I went close up, I saw that, no, it's actually just another strip from the cloth because look at this bent aspect. The blade wouldn't bend like that if it was meant to be a knife or probably wouldn't bend like that. So yeah, uh, unfortunately, I just have to dismiss that as 50% uh, or less proven for the pro shroud side. Um, all right, cool. Moving on to the next aspect is, <clears throat> um, yeah, so there are no uh, dimensions, two dimensions for the tomb. So let me, once again, bring that up. I should probably just leave it up. But um, yeah, so so look at this. Look at, if, if he was correct, this is the side of the tomb and this is the tomb's lid, it's just flat. There are no two dimensions there. And as we see with all in the panel review show, all the other Byzantine artworks have two dimensionality at least, right? They show the, the lid and stuff like that. Um, and you might just say, yeah, but Dale, weren't, weren't we saying that this artist just happens to be sucky, he's geometrically challenged. So maybe it is, but he's just, he sucks. He's too dumb to, to draw two dimensionality. Hmm. guess what my friends you've just been refuted by the upper panel because there's the tomb lid and look what it has two dimensionality you can see the edges and stuff like that so this guy knows how to draw three-dimensional effects look at the the shroud crumpled up or folded over and that sort of thing so uh yeah the the tomb lid is here in dim two dimensionality um and therefore if he was trying to draw the tomb lid and the tomb, he could have and probably should have drawn two-dimensionality there. Um, now, this isn't an overly strong argument. I, I'm assigning a 55% proven in favor of the pro shroud side based on the lack of two-dimensionality that that proves this is meant to portray a folded shroud cloth that covered Jesus. And this little crumpled up peep in the thing, it's probably just some kind of disheveled cloth because something was cut out and maybe this is the face cloth cut out. Um, so yeah, based on the lack of two-dimensionality, that may support Bob's hypothesis over and against Hughes that this is this crumpled up bit is the shroud itself and this is just a tomb lid. Um, so 55% proven on that. Next, uh, for the pro shroud side, we have the, the fact that the bottom left corner uh, of the represent shows that they're connected uh so this was something teddy mentioned it's something that tristan caspianca mentions as uh citing several scholars like thomas de wesselo who's a secular art historian and stuff and most experts seem to say yeah that this shows the connect the bend in the cloth uh showing it's all one piece of a cloth now hugh says no look you got the edge of the tomb uh and you know, it's it maybe perhaps it's an odd shaped tomb where it kind of dips down a bit. But yes, it's it's a bad drawing. Um, we, we shouldn't expect there to be a fully rectangular lid, like having it go all the way there like this. Um, because he's a bad drawer, plain and simple. That's what he would say. Now, I have to admit, I, I don't totally buy that explanation myself. Uh, that sounds a little ad hoc to me on Hugh Ferry's part. But uh, I have to admit, I have to admit um, some, some pro shroud guys, first of all, back it up by going to the upper panel and they say, well, look at the, look at the way the shroud is folded up here with the thing up there. It's, it's kind of exactly the same as what we have in the bottom panel, showing that there would be a rectangle, rectangle thing there, showing that, yeah, this could be his way of representing it's folded. Now, unfortunately, it's badly preserved it's erased in this corner we don't really get a, a good glimpse of what exactly is going on here it, it does the tomb continue to there and it's folded down or what is this line here is that the edge of the side of the tomb um well these two wavy lines kind of go over 
um, suggesting no, they are part of the same plot. Um, maybe this is just an, an X or, or part of the wavy lines that are going over as well uh, from one side of the plot to the next. Suggesting that for the artist, he's saying, yeah, these are all, this is all just one cloth, just folded in half kind of thing. And that's why the designs go from one side and overstep their bounds onto this. Um, I, in terms of my own assessment, I just said, look, because of it, the erasure here, uh, where we can't get a good glimpse, I'm not comfortable deciding one way or the other. So I'm agnostic on this as to whether this represents the tomb or represents the shroud. I don't think we can decide. It's 50% or less proven on the basis of this bottom left corner. Um, yeah, if it, if it was preserved better, I, I'm, we might be able to get a better idea. But to my mind, we just can't tell one way or the other on the basis of this corner here. Okay, uh, so let's move on to the next feature. And so yeah, just one last thing before we move on. Um, in terms of that upper corner, uh, that establishes, according to Dr. Thomas de Wesselo, um, that you know these two rectangles are also seen on the upper panel, um, with two rectangles representing the edge, kind of thing. So Thomas de Wesselo says, quote unquote, uh, it's equally plausible. Uh, the meeting in the lower left corner of the two zigzag patterns and cross patterns suggests that, quote unquote, the two rectangles are two halves of the same cloth in accordance with the depiction of the winding sheet in this upper panel seen above. Um, so yeah, that's uh, art historian, Byzantine expert, Dr. Thomas de Wesselo and his take, he's arguing for that again. I'm, I'm personally still agnostic just due to the erasure. I, I don't know what exactly what's going on, but okay. So moving on to our final feature, and this is actually a shroud skeptical counter feature. So let me show that image again, uh, the lower one. Now it's, this is a fairly obvious one. So looking at the bottom panel here, if this was based on the shroud of Turin and this is the shroud cloth, including this is the inside, uh, of the dorsal part of the cloth, what's missing? Hello, anybody home? Think, McFly, think. The image, the dorsal image should be showing on, in terms of if this is the upper part of the cloth, obviously this is the front side. So there's no image expected here because the image, the frontal image will be on the reverse side of that part of the cloth. But here where we're looking at the blood stains, we're looking at the inside of the dorsal side of the cloth. Where is the dorsal image of the Shroud Man? Uh, this is a devastating counter feature. If the guy had seen the Shroud images, and that's obvious from the upper panel, because we're saying he depicted Jesus on the basis of how he looks, the Shroud Man looks on the Shroud of Turin, why didn't he draw the dorsal side image of the Shroud Man here? Obviously, he wasn't using the Shroud of Turin as, as the basis for this picture that he drew. That's what the Shroud Skeptics will say is their counter feature. Now, just to kind of counter this, I do find this a persuasive, devastating defeater. Um, there are counters to it, right? So for example, Dr. Uh, Thibault Heimberger or Cataldo, they've hypothesized, but look, that the primary goal here of the artist, it's not to reproduce the image on the Shroud. That's not what he's trying to do. He's simply trying to evoke some of its features. And this is known to have happened in, in art history. He's trying to highlight certain features like those holes or the, the blood belt and, and the, pat, the weave patterns and stuff like that. For some reason, these stuck out in his heads and he wants to evoke these while being um, depicting this scene. He's not trying to accurately reproduce everything on the shroud and or even to go for the shroud man images themselves. Um, and if he, in fact, if he had drawn Shroud Man images here, it would take away from what he was trying to do by evoking these features, uh, like the holes or the weave or the blood patterns. Uh, so that's what um, some pro Shroud experts have said. I have to admit, I, I find that these replies are, are weak, to be honest. And, and because of that, I think the Shroud skeptic wins the battle for this counter feature. I, I assigned a 75% proven 
that the shroud is not the basis of this bottom panel simply because there are no images. So I'm really favoring the shroud skeptic. Okay, so with that said, uh, let me share my screen, full screen here. What's our overall, that's it for the bottom panel image. So what is our cumulative case for the bottom panel image? And as you can see, I've plugged all the factors into Bayes' theorem. So we have 75% uh, for this counter feature. So 100% minus 75% means that there's a 25% probability that the shroud was used uh, for the bottom image on the basis of there being no shroud images on the dorsal side. Um, I've I went higher, I assigned the bottom left corner was agnostic, so that's excluded from the Bayesian calculation. The no two dimensions, 55%, that's included. Uh, the blood belt, I assigned 65%, that's included. Rust belts, dimensions of the cloth being too long, that 50% or less, that's excluded. Um, uh, Bob Rucker's face, that was excluded. Uh, and the knife, that was excluded, 50% or less. Um, the L-shaped poker holes, that was our strongest, 75% proven for the positive side, that's included. 70% for the herringbone weave, that's included. And finally, 60% for the red crosses as blood stains factors. So plugging all these numbers into Bayes' theorem, what do we get? For the total for the bottom uh, panel, there is an 88.96% probability that the shroud was used to make the bottom panel, that the Shroud of Turin, he had seen it or remembered it or uh, was informed about some of these features, uh, or at the very least informed about some of these features. Again, now, uh, some art historians have argued that the artist who made the Hungarian Prey Codex, he never, he himself never saw the shroud, but he only heard about some of the features. And that could take away, well, that's why he didn't draw about the, the shroud images, for example. So that's another historically plausible scenario that some pro shroud experts have argued for. Um, and that sort of thing. Again, I, I didn't want to get into that, but still, I, I do think it's unlikely. I think that if some guy was reporting to the artist all these features of the shroud, he would definitely report the images being there, and that would probably be portrayed. I'm at least 75% convinced, which equals 25% in positive terms. So yeah, all things considered, we get 88.96% proven the, bot the shroud was used to make the bottom panel. Great, grand, and groovy. So now we have 44.68%, I believe, for the upper panel. So it's improbable that the features of the upper panel were made by the shroud, but it's extremely probable that the shroud was used for the bottom panel. Um, okay, so we're getting close to being able to make an overall cumulative case for both panels combined and what that means. The first, but before we do, we have to assess the prior probability. One last thing. The Shroud skeptic, Hugh Ferry, has um, advanced an argument whereby, and he's got about 300 uh, pages, apparently, um, whereby he's depicted, seen, shown scenes um, of the uh, burial of Jesus. Let me just take a quick, you know, it, and I have to admit, yeah, that these paintings are depicting the same scene, the post-resurrection scene, have very similar motifs. You saw it in Shroud Panel Show uh, Part 3 or Part 1, where Bob, or Part 3, where Bob was showing about six of these pictures, and there are a lot of them in um, Hugh Ferry's papers somewhere in here. I, I should have wrote down the page for that, but the, the point is, yeah, this is a common scene, and there are a lot of common motifs, a crumpled up shroud, a lid askew from the tomb, the angel sitting on the lid or near the lid, pointing, saying Jesus to the closed, crumpled bit or to the empty tomb and saying Jesus is God. <sighs> to the three women showing up at the tomb. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a common scene in Byzantine art. And this picture does largely conform to that established artistic motif. I, I wish I could show you guys a picture of it. I, had it somewhere, but um, all right, doesn't want to pop up, but uh, oh, maybe it's in his uh, shroud thing part two, actually. Hang on one second, let me just pause it and I'll bring it up the picture. 
Well, I, I was unable to find that and I don't have time, but just take my word for it that, uh, yeah, the, this is a typical scene and the Hungarian Prey Codex, the bottom panel as well as the upper panel do largely conform. There are differences and stuff like that, but they more or less conform to these established motifs. So on that basis, the prior probability is that, yeah, the, the impetus for this Hungarian Prey Codex artist's depictions here are these prior artworks, are, are these established themes and motifs in other artistic paintings depicting these scenes in Christian iconography, uh, going back centuries, as, as Hugh is proving, and they are repeated over and over again. I think Hugh has a persuasive case. I think, again, the Shroud Skeptic wins the battle. Now, I actually assigned an 85% proven here. Now, there are counters to this, right? So, for example, here's a quote uh, by, uh, again, a world's expert, Dr. Heinberg, uh, Thibault Heinberger, who argues, quote unquote, on a deeper level, the comparison between differences and congruences leads to the idea that the artist wanted the to faithfully reproduce the Shroud of Turin and not simply evoke it. However, it is perfectly possible to maintain that the artist would have constrained the shroud by inserting it into the conventional framework of his time. Cataldo hypothesized that the primary goal of the artist, Hungarian artist, was not to reproduce the image on the shroud, but to evoke some of its features. This artist would then have been a testimony of faith and spiritual support. Sorry, the, this depiction would have been a testimony of faith and spiritual support without ever being thought of as evidence or something like that. So an evocation does not seek the accumulation of convincing elements. Um, so that's sort of the counter is, look, he, this artist is just tweaking and taking what he saw with the Shroud of Turin or what he remembers from the Shroud of Turin and or what he was told about the Shroud of Turin and its remarkable features that he wants to evoke within the people looking at his painting. Um, and he's using that and putting it within the framework of the post-resurrection scene that he already knows uh, within his artistic culture surrounding him in Christian iconography and what he's already seen. Um, so there's nothing implausible that that happens all the time and scientifically proven fact and historically proven fact and stuff like that. But nonetheless, I, I think that Hugh is very, very probably right. And maybe I'm being too generous to the Shroud skeptic. I signed an 85% proven that we can't prove the Shroud was the impetus for these images on the basis that it it uh, follows these uh, common uh, post-resurrection artistic scenes that were existed in the culture prior to 11. 92 to 1195 when the Prey Codex was made. And especially problematic for me is that crumpled up, disheveled bit. Uh, let me just show that again. Um, oh, I closed it, son of a gun. That crumpled up bit in the middle of the thing, um, in the middle of the tomb lid or in the middle of the shroud, um, that seems to be the common motif. And it does seem to me that he was probably right that that's what the artist was trying to say, given our background knowledge of all the other paintings that have crumpled up shrouds hanging over a tomb with the lid askew. Um, so that's why I assigned it so high here. Um, really, it is that middle part, that crumpled up bit. Um, let me just, yeah, let me pause and show you guys. So here it is. Um, and as you can see, part it's part C. This really does look, given the background knowledge alone, the prior probability is this is probably not representing what Bob Rucker is, like a disheveled bit of the shroud as a whole where they cut off the face or something like that. No, this is probably the shroud itself. Um, or as Teddy said, well, this is probably the sudarium. Well, with these strips going, I don't know about that. I'm not, I don't know. Again, give it a priori given our background knowledge, this is probably, very probably the shroud, and this is very probably the lid, and this is very probably meant to be the tomb, just a priori, based on the background knowledge of the hundreds of paintings that depict this same scene, and they have all these similar com commonalities. So um, that's it. In terms, That's the final factor. As I said, 85% for the shroud skeptic.
You fairy is kicking rumps lately. So what's our final, final calculation in terms of the Hungarian Prey Codex? I have to admit, this was a nail biter for me because I didn't, we had factors where the Shroud Skeptic was one very, and had very strong persuasive bits of arguments or evidences. On the other side, we had a lot of persuasive arguments as well. They weren't quite as strong in isolation, but again, we're talking about the cumulative effect. So remember with the upper panel, all of the factors combined, we got 44.68% proven that the Shroud of Turin was the impetus for the Hungarian Prey Codex. Shroud Skeptic wins in isolation. In isolation for the bottom panel, Pro Shrouds kick you fairies rumps from here to Pluto. 88.96% proven that the Shroud was used to create these images. The prior probability times the prior probability in base theorem. Oops, Shroud Skeptic kicks Pro Shroud guys' butts from here to Pluto. It's only a 15% prior probability, given all our background knowledge of these scenes in Christian iconography and the similarities to what we have with the Hungarian Prey Codex, uh, there's only a 15% probability that the Shroud of Turin um, was the impetus for that. So we plugged that into Bayes' theorem. Obviously, I was a little liberal. I didn't bother putting in all the numbers, but you get what I'm doing here. And the point is, the final came out, I was relieved, more probable than not. 53.45% probability that the Shroud of Turin, the Shroud Man, and the Shroud of Turin cloth was uh, what the Hungarian Prey Codex artist used in making his images, or it was a source that he used. He had to have seen the Shroud of Turin to make those features and those images, both the upper and bottom, combined. Um, so yeah, it's more probable than not that the Shroud of Turin, if obviously it was used, the Hungarian Prey Codex, we know has a firm date, 1192 to 1195 is when those images, the upper and bottom panel was made. No one doubts that. Every historian in the world agrees with that. Shroud skeptics like Hugh Ferry agree with that. Well, therefore, if the Hungarian Prey Codex artist used the Shroud of Turin, that means the Shroud of Turin must not be medieval. It dates to 1195 at the latest or earlier. And obviously it's prior to when the guy used it, right? So um, yeah, here we go. It's proof on a balance of probabilities. It's more probable than not that premise two of that Shroud skeptic's argument is false. The Shroud is not probably medieval. By medieval here, we mean medieval in the sense that it dates to 1350s, you know, when the Shroud skeptics like to say it was in, in Leary, France. Uh, no, this proves the Hungarian Prey Codex proves that the Shroud goes back to goes back to 1192 to 1195 at the latest. It's and it's more likely it's older than that as we look at other evidences. And again, 53.45% proven on the basis of the Hungarian Prey Codex evidence alone. So Woohoo! Uh, here we finally got something to put into our calculations here. Um, okay, so that's it for the Hungarian Prey Codex. Um, let's uh, put that away. Let me um, put everything to do a conclusion for this Shroud Panel Review Summary Show. Um, part one here, let's, let me put a cap on it and review where we are numbers-wise in terms of the truth or falsity of premise two.